The new me is beauty. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, people used to say, no, Norman's okay, but if you followed what he said, everything would be usable, but it would be ugly. Well, I didn't have that in mind, so... This is neat. Thank you for setting up my display. I mean, it's just wonderful. And I haven't the slightest idea what it does, or what it's good for, but I want it. <laughs> and that's my new life. My new life is trying to understand what beauty is about, and pretty, and emotions. The new me is all about making things kind of neat and fun. And so this is a Philippe Stark juicer produced by Alessi. It's so much fun I have it in my house, but I have it in the entryway. I don't use it to make juice. <laughs> In fact, I bought the uh, gold-plated special edition, and it comes with a little slip of paper that says, um, don't use this juicer to make juice. The acidic, well, the acid will ruin the gold plating. <laughs> so actually, I took a carton of orange juice and I poured it in the glass to take this picture. <laughs> but beneath it is, is a wonderful knife. It's a global cutting knife made in Japan. First of all, look at the shape. It's just wonderful to look at. Second of all, it's really beautifully balanced. It holds, it feels well. And third of all, it's so sharp, it just cuts. It's a delight to use. And so it's got everything, right? It's beautiful and it's functional. And I can tell you stories about it which makes it reflective. And so you will see I have a theory of emotion and those are the three components. Hiroshi Ishii and his group at the MIT Media Labs took a ping pong table and a projector above it. And on the ping pong table, they projected an image of water and fish swimming in it. And as you play ping pong, whenever the ball hits part of the table, the ripples spread out and the fish run away. But of course, then the ball hits the other side and the ripples are the poor fish. They can't find any peace and quiet. And is that a good way to play ping pong? No. But is it fun? Yeah. Yeah. So, or look at Google. If you type in, oh, say, emotion and design, you get 10 pages of results. So Google just took their logo and they spread it out. Instead of saying, you got 73,000 results, this is one through 20, next. They just give you as many O's as there are pages. It's really simple and subtle. I bet a lot of you have seen it and never noticed it. That's a subconscious mind, sort of notices it. It probably is kind of pleasant and you didn't know why. And it's just clever. And of course, what's especially good is you type design and emotion the first response out of those 10 pages is my website. <laughs> now, the weird thing is Google lies. Because if I type design and emotion, it says, you don't need the and, we do it anyway. So, okay, so I type design emotion, and my website wasn't first again, it was, it was third. Oh, well, different story. There was this wonderful review in the New York Times about the Mini Cooper automobile. It said, you know, this is a car that has lots of faults. Buy it anyway. It's so much fun to drive. And if you look at the inside of the car, I mean, I loved it. I wanted to see. I rented it. So this is me taking a picture while my son is driving. And um, the inside of the car, the whole design is fun. It's round. It's neat. The, the controls work wonderfully. So that's my new life. It's all about fun. I really have the feeling that pleasant things work better. And that never made any sense to me until I finally figured out, look, I'm going to put a plank on the ground. So imagine I have a plank about two feet wide and 30 feet long, and I'm going to walk on it. And you see, I can walk on it without looking. And I can go back and forth and I can jump up and down. No problem. Now I'm going to put the plank 300 feet in the air and I'm not going to go near it. Thank you. Intense fear paralyzes you. It actually affects, in fact, affects the way the brain works. So Paul Saffo, before he gave his talk, said that um, he didn't really have it down until just a few days or even hours before the talk. And that anxiety was really helpful in causing him to focus. And that's what fear and anxiety does. It causes you to be what's called depth-first processing, to focus, not to be distracted. And I couldn't force myself across that. Now, some people can, circus workers, steel workers, but it really changes the way you think. And then a psychologist, Alice Eisen, did this wonderful experiment. She brought students in to solve problems. 
So she'd bring people into the room, and there'd be a string hanging down here, and a string hanging down here, and it was an empty room, except there'd be a table with a bunch of crap on it, some papers and scissors and stuff. And she'd bring them in, and she'd say, um, this is an IQ test, and it determines how well you do in life. Um, would you tie those three, two strings together? So they'd take one string, and they'd pull it over here, and they couldn't reach the other string. Still can't reach it. And Basically, none of them could solve it. You bring in a second group of people, and you say, um, oh, before we start, um, I got this box of candy, and I don't eat candy. Would you like the box of candy? And it turns out they liked it, and it made them happy. Not very happy, but a little bit of happy. And guess what? They solved the problem. And it turns out that when you're anxious, you squirt neurotransmitters in the brain, which focuses you, makes you depth first. And when you're happy, what we call positive valence. You squirt dopamine into the prefrontal lobes, which makes you a breadth-first problem solver. You're more susceptible to interruption you do out-of-the-box thinking. That's what that brainstorming is about, right? With brainstorming, we make you uh, happy, we play games, and we say no criticism, and you get all these weird, neat ideas. But in fact, if that's how you always were, you'd never get any work done, because you'd be working along and say, oh, I got a new way of doing it. <laughs> so to get work done, you got to set a deadline, right? and you've got to be anxious. So the brain works differently, and if you're happy, things work better because you're more creative. You get a little problem, you say, yeah, I'll figure it out. No big deal. And there's something I call the visceral level of processing, biology. We have co-adapted through biology to like bright colors. That's especially good that mammals and primates like fruits and bright plants because you eat the fruit and you thereby spread the seed. There's an amazing amount of stuff that's built into the brain. We dislike bitter taste. We dislike loud sounds. We dislike hot temperatures, cold temperatures. We dislike scolding voices. We dislike frowning faces. We like symmetrical faces, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the visceral level. And in design, you can express visceral in lots of ways, like the choice of type fonts and the red for hot, exciting. Or the 1963 Jaguar. It's actually a crummy car. It falls apart all the time, but the owners love it, and it's beautiful. It's in the Museum of Modern Art. A water bottle. You buy it because of the bottle, not because of the water. And when people are finished, they don't throw it away. They keep it for, you know, it's like the old wine bottles you use it for decoration. Or you maybe fill it with water again, which proves it's not the water. It's all about the visceral experience. The middle level of processing is the behavioral level, and that's actually where most of our stuff gets done. Visceral is subconscious, you're unaware of it. Behavioral is subconscious, you're unaware of it. Almost everything we do is subconscious. I'm walking around the stage, I am not attending to the control of my legs. I'm doing a lot, most of my talk is subconscious, it's been rehearsed and thought about a lot. Uh, most of it's what we do is subconscious. Automatic behavior, skilled behavior is subconscious, controlled by the behavioral side. And behavioral design is all about feeling in control, which includes usability and understanding, but also the feel and heft. That, that's why the global knives are so neat. They're so nicely balanced, so sharp. You really feel your control of the cutting. Or just driving a high-performance sports car over a demanding curve, but again, feeling that you are in complete control of the environment, or the sensual feeling. This is a colder shower, a waterfall shower, and actually all those knobs beneath are also shower heads that will squirt you all around, and, and you can stay in that shower for hours. And not waste water, by the way. It recirculates the same dirty water. <laughs> or this. This is a really neat teapot I found, high tea at the Four Seasons Hotel in Chicago. It's a Ronnevelt tilting teapot. That's what, kind of what the teapot looks like, but the way you use it is you lay it on its back, and you put tea in, and then you fill it with water. The water then seeps over the tea, and the tea is sitting uh, in this stuff to the right. The tea is to the right of this line. There's a little ledge inside, so the tea is sitting there, and the water is filling it up like that. And when the tea is ready, or almost ready, you tilt it. And that means the tea is partially covered while it completes uh, the brewing, and when it's finished, you put it vertically, and now the tea is, remember, above this line, and the water only comes to here, and so it keeps the tea out. And on top of that, it communicates, which is what emotion does. Emotion is all about acting. Emotion is really about acting. It's being safe in the world, so that cognition is about understanding the world. Emotion